During the 7th and 8th centuries AD, a powerful new faith was about to change the world, the faith of Islam. Its followers launched a conquest not only by the sword, but with the power of ideas. 200 years after the death of Muhammad, his message and the new Arab empire were transforming three continents. Now comes a new empire, a political new configuration, and driven by a religious and newly defined civilization. This new civilization expanding beyond its own dreams within a period of very short time. Literally, the largest empire civilization had ever known. The Arabic word for conquest, fatu, literally means openings. Islam sowed the seeds of its faith to the four winds and a world of opportunities opened before it. But the vast empire's spiritual core remained at its birthplace, the holy city of Mecca. From every corner of the Muslim world, the faithful embarked on the traditional journey to Mecca, a sacred pilgrimage known as the Hajj. The pilgrimage became a, a central devotional and ritual feature in Islamic life. In fact, since the life of Muhammad himself, the pilgrimage has symbolized probably more than any other Islamic ritual activity, unity among all people and equality. The Hajj set humanity in motion. For the first time since the reign of Alexander the Great, cultures and caravans now flowed freely. Borders closed for a thousand years, opened. Both ideas and goods went back and forth over incredible distances. Since every Muslim is enjoined once in his life to visit Mecca, it means that there were caravans carrying goods and pilgrims and ideas and people. And they all met together in Mecca once a year, and then things would radiate back home. So if there was an invention that was discovered in Samarkand, it could be within the year that it would be known in Cordova. Where pilgrims trod, traders soon followed. Mohammed himself had been a man of commerce, and now the spread of his message brought with it the spread of trade and the Islamic way of life. Trade was incredibly important in the Islamic world simply because of its geographical position. It was, and still is, between West, what we call the West and what people always called the East. Uh, so it was a natural land bridge connecting China to Europe. In only two centuries, Islam had extended its reach from Spain all the way to the edge of India. It took nearly a year to travel from one end of the Arab Empire to the other. At its heart was a fabled city of wealth. It was called Baghdad. The palaces of ancient Baghdad have been lost over the centuries but in its glory, it rivaled ancient Athens or Rome. It was a magnificent architectural achievement, the pride of Islam in a new age. One visitor left this account. All the exquisite neighborhoods covered with parks, gardens, villas, and beautiful promenades are filled with bazaars and finely built mosques and baths. They stretch for miles on both sides of the glittering river. 
But what made this the greatest city of its time was more than just what met the eye. It was the company it kept. Scholars made Baghdad the jewel of the world. Certainly from the 8th century on, Baghdad was the center of learning in the Islamic world, and all major innovations either came from Baghdad or quickly came to Baghdad because the best people came to Baghdad, the best thinkers, the best uh, philosophers, uh, the best artists. They came in search of answers to pragmatic questions. The empire's meteoric growth had left its new leaders overwhelmed. They had staggering engineering and logistical problems to contend with. Solving them would take the greatest minds of the day. Under the new empire now, you are responsible for public hygiene, you are responsible for the marketplace, you are responsible for goods being sold in the marketplace. All of those require some basic elementary sciences. This new civilization, having a need for science, really stems from the need to run that empire. The best minds rose to the call. The finest were welcomed at a center of scholarship, Baghdad's renowned House of Wisdom. It was a magnet for scholars and intellectuals who came um, and worked in the academies. There were public libraries associated with the palace and scholars came from all over the empire. And there were scholars from Iran, there were scholars from Byzantium who came. Some were Christians, some were Muslims, some were Jews. And all of these different sort of threads of human knowledge came together in the city of Baghdad. So uh, the net effect of this is that you've got uh, human uh, individuals from radically different cultural traditions being thrown into the same crucible. The challenge that greeted these scholars was daunting. The great works of the ancients had to be transformed into a wholly new body of knowledge. Competition for jobs developed within a new intellectual elite. And from there on, every single scientist is competing for that job. They were competing among themselves almost just, just in the same way that modern, modern bureaucrats and modern academicians will fight among themselves. Scholars were dispatched across the empire to locate as many ancient texts as possible. The first international scientific venture in history. Unlike their Christian counterparts, Muslim thinkers saw no insurmountable contradiction between their faith and the laws governing the natural world. So they embraced Aristotle and Plato, writers the Christian church considered blasphemous. So this is the time when we begin to see scientists, bureaucrats, what have you, going and seeking from whatever civilization that had any sciences before, be it the Greek, be it the Indian, be it the Persian, and so on. From the Hindus came mathematical concepts that guide us today. It was the scholars of the House of Wisdom who developed the system of Arabic numerals, still in use. It is they who translated and transformed the writings of the Greeks and made a gift of them to the modern Western world. The Renaissance had its beginnings in Baghdad. They managed to assimilate quite a lot of the rich legacy of the Hellenistic world, translated into Arabic initially, which was then made available to all other participants in uh, the new Islamic civilization. Arabic emerges as the language of learning throughout the region. This is a very significant development in human intellectual history. Having amassed the knowledge, the Muslims now began to challenge it. This was perhaps their most important contribution the scientific process was born. They wanted to know why 
a very intelligent Greek scientist whose text they were just admiring and they were verifying it, why would he make a mistake in the first place? So they began to dig, was it because he didn't have the right instruments or is it because he didn't have the right methodology to use the instruments for the verifications of observation? It is this spirit. You see, the spirit of questioning, the spirit of saying that we have to build science constantly on a systematic, consistent basis where we make a physical proposition of how the universe ought to be run and the mathematical representation of that physical universe ought to match. Now you begin to have what I call the birth of the new Islamic science. Algebra and trigonometry, engineering and astronomy, Countless disciplines integral to our lives today trace their roots to Islamic scientists. More surprising, perhaps, were their innovations in medicine. At a time when Europeans were praying to the bones of their saints to cure their illnesses, Muslim physicians developed an innovative theory that disease was transmitted through tiny airborne organisms, the precursor to the study of germs. They determined that sick patients should be quarantined and then treated. This is the basis of the institution most fundamental to medicine today, the hospital. Funded mainly through religious endowments, Muslim hospitals had separate wards for patients suffering from different kinds of disease. Even mental illness was treated. Their studies of anatomy were so sophisticated that they remained in use by Muslim and European physicians for 600 years. Muslim scientists were especially intrigued by light, lenses, and the physiology of the human eye. The father of optics was a Muslim named Ibn al-Haytham. His work with lenses eventually led to the invention of the modern camera. He produced the first treatise that ventured to explain how the eye actually sees. A thousand years before the West dared to take up the practice, Muslim doctors were removing cataracts surgically, clearing them from the eye with a hollow needle. But for all this knowledge to transform and illuminate an empire, it had to be copied and shared across a hundred different cities in the Islamic world. For this, there was a new invention one that is still fundamental to learning and knowledge today. Paper. Around the year 700-750, when Muslim armies reached Central Asia, they encountered paper for the first time. And very quickly, the Muslim bureaucracy um, started using paper. You find that, you know, within 50 years it's in Syria, and then a few years after that it's in, it's in Egypt, and then it's in North Africa, and then it's in, in Sicily, and then it's in Spain. And that's where Europe learned to make paper from. They learned to make it from the Arabs. We begin to have people with family names like papermaker. So, in other words, it, not only uh, that paper was available, it must have become a very, very uh, widespread industry. And hence, the acquisition of books must have also become very easy. With the wide use of books and paper, hundreds of scribes, some of whom were women, were kept busy transcribing the translations and new writings of the Baghdad scholars. All of this knowledge that's being acquired from the Greeks and from the Indians and from Central Asia and stuff is all being written down in books on paper. And that these books are being copied and recopied and sent around. We know, for example, that there was a street of booksellers um, with more than a hundred shops, each one with paper and books for sale. Um, 
And this is a time when, you know, in uh, Europe, a monastery would be lucky if it had five or ten books. While the monks of the West were hoarding their wisdom on scraps of expensive parchment, paper enabled Islamic civilization to spread its newfound knowledge far and wide, creating a single community linking three continents. So the chief distinction, therefore, of Islamic civilization, uh, in addition to the fact that it made new leaps of originality, new transformations in uh, traditions of learning and, and everything else possible, is the fact that it enabled human beings to consider the possibility of thinking about the globe as a single unit, humanity. In all the broad empire, there was one place the Christian world could experience the lifestyle Muslims now took for granted. Southern Spain. Here, on the European continent itself, Islamic culture would begin to have an effect on the European civilization around it. A thousand years ago, the Spanish city of Cordoba was a center of learning and culture that rivaled Baghdad. Today, Cordoba's narrow lanes hearken to its medieval past. During the Dark Ages, this was the most prosperous and sophisticated metropolis on the continent. It had street lights and paved roads, libraries, hospitals and palaces. This was a city of light, a Muslim city. The city of Cordoba in the 9th and 10th centuries was one of the biggest and most exciting in Europe. We have descriptions of it by people coming and saying, all these flowers everywhere, this, this open streets, this, this wonderful light coming down. Uh, northern cities were dark. Cordoba had running water, people lived in big houses, in contrast, in Paris, people lived in shacks by the side of the river. The glory of medieval Cordoba is here, in what is now the great Roman Catholic cathedral in the middle of town. But the Cordoba Cathedral of today began its life as a mosque, one of the grandest of the Islamic Empire. The Great Mosque in Cordoba was simply the biggest mosque in the biggest city in southern Europe. When you climb up into the church tower, which used to be a minaret, you look out over this expanse of, of roof, it's quite amazing to see this cathedral complete with flying buttresses popping up out of this, the middle of this massive mosque. Many, many people came to visit it to view the wonders of the mosque which had rib vaulting, the kind of vaulting which is like this, and which 100 years later, by a mere coincidence you might think, but not at all a coincidence, appears in the Gothic cathedrals of Northern Europe, in Lincoln Cathedral, in Chartres Cathedral in France, where does that come from? Obviously, influenced by the Great Mosque of Cordoba in the south of Spain. For the occasional European Christian traveler, Cordoba was their one opportunity to glimpse the Islamic world. What they saw was shocking. Most of Europe at that time languished in poverty and squalor. Cordoba was a pageant of prosperity and enlightenment. In the um, 10th century, there was a Saxon nun with the unpronounceable name of Hrotswitha, who called medieval Cordoba the ornament of the world. She was very, very taken with the place. And there you are, she's a Christian nun. As Europeans made their way from the cold stone of their northern castles into the glorious Muslim cities of southern Spain, they couldn't help but be impressed. In the green hills above Granada was a palace of startling elegance. 
a shining example of the richness and sophistication Islam brought to medieval Europe. It is called the Alhambra. The Alhambra is perhaps the most famous example of, of, of Islamic architecture to, to most Westerners. It is the, the best remaining example of what a medieval Muslim palace would have looked like. Echoed in the finely carved geometric plaster work and marble pillars is a vanished lifestyle of extraordinary luxury. The Alhambra reveals the pinnacle of Islamic culture and urbanity. The beauty of the Alhambra is not so much in the individual details. No, it's more the combination of everything. That is, this wonderful um, sort of orchestrated interplay of different textures and surfaces of light and space and water playing inside and outside of, of buildings. It's almost like a symphony of different elements that are very carefully brought together to provide exquisite enjoyment. Here, the Muslim elite relished the good life. Reposing on lush carpets, surrounded by perfume and music, the privileged few debated the nature of God, the subtleties of Greek philosophy, or the most recent mathematical revelations from India, while they dined on spiced delicacies served on Chinese porcelains. They strolled the grounds through gardens irrigated by complex gravity-fed water systems. How far Muhammad's followers had come from the life of desert nomads. How distant they felt from the rest of the European continent they now shared. Christian Europe, due north, was struggling on through the Dark Ages. But at the dawn of the 11th century, a tragedy in Jerusalem would put Muslims and European Christians on a collision course. Jerusalem was ruled by an Egyptian caliph, an infamous man named Al-Hakim. Al-Hakim was certainly a deviation from the norm. Clinically speaking, I suppose today we'd regard him as a madman, as someone who was simply insane. For 200 years, Christian holy places in Jerusalem had been respected and protected by Muslim rulers. In 1009, the Egyptian ruler, Al-Hakim, broke with that tradition. He ordered the holiest church in Christendom destroyed. And horror of horrors, he burnt down the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Now, nobody knows quite why he did it, and you can have your own theories about it, but... Uh, the fact of the matter was that that sent shivers of terror and anxiety through Christendom. In a way, of course, Al-Hakim was the one exception that proved the rule for Christians that Christians had been speaking of for centuries, of Muslims as intolerant, mad, uh, uh, slavering heretics who simply could not uh, be expected to abide by the rules of civilized human beings. The fact that Al-Hakim's successor um, rebuilt the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it was done by 1048 with Byzantine help, didn't cut any ice. Um, there was this perception now that things were not going well in the Holy Land. 
In Europe, anti-Muslim sentiment simmered. By 1095, it reached the boiling point. Pope Urban II spent most of that year traveling through France, imploring his feudal lords to unite in a campaign of bloodshed. Hasten to exterminate this vile race from the lands of your eastern brethren, the Pope demanded. Jerusalem is the navel of the world. She cries out to be liberated. Christ himself commands it. So we've got a merging or a, a coming together of uh, military service and religion, which uh, served the purposes, if you like, of a pope who in 1095 made his famous call to crusade to rescue the endangered holy places um, in the East, and in particular, Jerusalem. In 1097, Muslim shepherds in Syria caught their first glimpse of a sight that would soon strike terror throughout the Holy Land. When the Crusaders struck, by sheer chance, the Arab Empire was at its most vulnerable, broken into feuding kingdoms and petty dynasties. They couldn't have chosen a better moment because the Muslim world was in a very fragmented state. The, the great rulers of the time had died, and into that power vacuum there came this most unexpected enemy, the Crusaders from Western Europe. Who would have thought that a new enemy would come to the Islamic world from that unexpected quarter? It was completely unprecedented. It was a real surprise. The Muslims didn't really know who they were. They thought they were just another lot of Byzantines who were coming as usual to be a nuisance and, and fight on the borders. They had no idea that there was this extraordinary surge of religious fervor and fanaticism coming from Western Europe and that the aim of this group was Jerusalem. History is haunted by days of incomprehensible horror. Few are darker than July 15, 1099, when the Crusaders entered Jerusalem. The massacre must have been terrible. The, 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 the fear, the fleeing of the population, It must have been horrendous. From a letter to the Pope from the Crusaders. If you want to know what was done to the enemies we found in the city, know this. Our men rode in the blood of the Saracens up to the knees of their horses. They saw the holy city and they were in a state of exultation. And perhaps that's why, when they flooded through the um, gates of the city, that they were fired up with fanaticism and zeal, and that's why there was this terrible massacre in the name of Christendom. It was a blot on the name of Christendom in the Muslim view, and justifiably so. Even Christians weren't spared. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, dozens of worshippers from Eastern sects were massacred. To the Crusaders, they were nothing more than foreigners. The Christian chronicles record the carnage. The Saracens, who were still alive, dragged the dead ones out and made huge piles of them. Such a slaughter of pagans, no one has ever seen or heard of. The pyres they made were like pyramids. They shocked the Muslim world when they came. 
There are a number of extremely moving lamentations in poetry which date from that period. And the Arab poets of the time talk about the feelings of anguish and terror which the Crusaders, or the Franks as they're called in the Arab sources, caused the local people, the old women, the young girls, those who are cloistered away in their houses are trembling with fear. The whole imagery is, is that of uh, the rape of their land and the um, terrible impurities caused by these barbarian infidels coming into their sacred space. We have mingled blood with flowing tears and there is no room left in us for pity. To shed tears is man's worst weapon when the swords stir up the embers of war. When blood has been spilt, when sweet girls must hide their lovely faces in their hands for shame. The first crusade was over. Of the 100,000 men who began the campaign, most would eventually return to Europe, having had only a glimpse of Muslim life. The job of occupying Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside fell to the 20,000 who remained, indefinitely. To secure their occupation, the intruders did hear what they had done in Europe. They built castles. The Crusaders built the finest castles that the Near East has ever seen. And the proof of that is that they're still there. When everything else may have faded away, the Crusader castles remain a living testimony to their presence. And Crac des Chevaliers in Syria is the Crusader castle over them all. It's very, very big, it's strong, it's impenetrable. It's a living example of the way that a number of the Crusader castles couldn't be taken by siege. You can see for miles and miles from it and see the other castles that would have been, you know, in visual distance for communication by fire and smoke signals. It's got, you know, all the accoutrements of a, of a good medieval castle with battlements and turrets and places for pouring boiling oil and other liquids down onto the enemy. But inside that castle, what was life really like? It wasn't merriment and, and festivity. It was constant fear. You had to be on the lookout in case someone was trying to mine the castle or to climb over the walls with scaling ladders. The people outside, the population, the local peasantry, they were not uh, friendly, so you had to watch their movements all the time. It, it was a, a terrifying place. The Crusaders made treaties and broke them. They harassed the traders who passed by their castles. As they raided caravans, the Crusaders learned of a luxurious lifestyle unheard of in Europe. Well, materially, the Crusaders were just blown away by what they found in the Middle East, and they took a lot of it back with them. Uh, inlaid metalwork, uh, textiles, silks, things like that. They had just never seen in such quantities before. The good life. These things they brought back to Europe, some as souvenirs, and in fact there was a whole uh, industry that developed in the Middle East of providing souvenirs for the Crusaders to take back. It is perhaps a Western bias to imagine the Crusaders were a decisive force in world events, devastating to the Islamic culture and trade. The truth is, while the Knights of the Crusades were bunkering down in their castles, Islam was spreading its influence and flourishing. Muhammad's message rang out as clear and strong as it ever had. Allahu Akbar! 
Mosques were now on every horizon. They welcomed traders. They housed schools and hospitals. Through Islamic architecture, literature and music, a vibrant culture was emerging in celebration of a singular faith. Faith had launched an empire. Culture was now enlivening it. But ultimately, what united it was trade. For the Muslims, trade, like science, brought innovation. Business was expedited by a revolutionary concept called the SAC, a check that could be written in Spain and cashed in India. Writing a check assumes that someone's going to honor it and cash it at the other end, and that if you give the money or you have the money in one place, that someone will say, I have access to that somewhere else. So this implies that you have some kind of central bank or central loan organization who's going to be good for the money. Um, so it frees up your ability to travel. Um, it frees up commerce because, again, the money doesn't have to be moved from Samarkand back to, to Cordoba in order to go back the other way the next year so that you can base it all on trust and faith. Uh, and Muslims became some of the greatest merchants of Middle Ages. And the greatest craftsmen as well. From the Persians, Muslim blacksmiths learned how to fold steel to give it strength and flexibility. The swords made in Toledo and Damascus had no equal in the world. But the economic backbone of Islam's expanding wealth was textiles. The demand for the products of Muslim looms was enormous, for cashmere, cotton and silk. Textiles were simply the gas and steel industry of medieval times. Because you have to think of textiles not only as growing the plants, but making all the dyes. And it was the dyes that were particularly expensive and uh, imported the farthest. And then you need all the fixtures and mordants and uh, equipment for looms. And then you need to transport these textiles. So collectively, the industry of making and transporting textiles was the mainstay of the economy. While Europeans settled for coarse woolen and linen garments, Muslims wore brocaded fabrics of organdy, damask and taffeta, words that came into the English language from Arabic and Persian. The fabrics that were produced in the Islamic world were among the finest ever produced. And they were made of not only plain linen or cotton, but also very, very fancy silks, um, cloth of gold where silk thread is wrapped with gold um, and um, with very, very complicated patterns. These complex patterns were coveted by wealthy Europeans and the church as well. When the Christians needed a cloth worthy of wrapping the bones of their saints, the choice was obvious. They looked to a Muslim loom. But sometimes the fabrics were trimmed with decorative Arabic text from the Holy Quran. And so the words of the Prophet sometimes appeared in shocking proximity to Christendom's holiest icons. It is not unusual to find in uh, Italian Renaissance paintings, for example, to find paintings of the Virgin wearing a robe of very fancy patterned cloth and 
precious silks embroidered with gold um, or woven with gold designs. Sometimes uh, they would say things with an Arabic inscription on it, which says, there is no God but God, Muhammad is his prophet, in Arabic. After almost a hundred years of broken treaties and sporadic fighting, the Muslims reached a turning point in their struggles against the Crusaders. It came in the person of one of Islam's most celebrated figures. His name was Salah Uddin, but the West would remember him and come to revere him as Saladin. There is certainly one thing that we must recognize about Saladin, and that is that he was successful where many others of his faith and of his part of the world had not been. That he possessed one unusual feature, uh, in addition to his intelligence and his robust physical strength, he certainly seems to have been a great inspirer of his military followers. In 1187, Saladin amassed an army of 12,000 mounted warriors and lured the Crusaders out of Jerusalem onto a plain between two hills called the Horns of Hattin. On the evening of July 3rd, after a long march, the Crusaders camped on a barren hillside. There was nothing but a waterless terrain and they we're talking about July, we're talking about the Middle East, we're talking about incredible heat and no water. As dawn approached, Saladin's men set fire to the tall grass, and a strong wind carried the flames into the Christian encampment. And very soon they found themselves surrounded, as in the Muslim tactic, by their enemy and uh, panic set in. The flames bore down on them and the heat became intense, Saladin's secretary wrote. The people of the Trinity were consumed by the fire of flames, the fire of thirst and the fire of arrows. The army of the Crusaders was totally decimated. Um, the, uh, the victory at Hattin was a real turning point for Saladin. It meant that he could then proceed to take Jerusalem later on that year. Three months later, Saladin entered Jerusalem. For the first time in almost a century, the call to prayer floated over the holy city once again. Allah! And yet, remarkably, Saladin levelled no retaliation against Christians or their holy places. In the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Mass was celebrated as usual. Saladin also decreed that Christians who wished to could leave the city with their property. Those who chose to stay would be allowed to worship freely. When his reputation reached Western Europe of the way he had behaved in, in Jerusalem over the conquest, he gradually became the most uh, famous Muslim of all time. Saladin's victory did not put an end to Western aspirations in the Near East. Other crusades would follow, though, as with the first, they would hardly have an impact on the larger Islamic culture. The crusaders would eventually be driven from their citadels along the coast and return to Europe. Their only lasting legacy, a few abandoned castles. But the returning crusaders found themselves changed by their contact with Islamic culture the long-term impact on European life would be profound. They were just amazed by the material culture that they found there. I mean, the quality of the merchandise, the quality of the goods, was far better than anything they could find at home, and they brought it home with them. 
They came back, for example, with a taste for highly spiced food. They imported pepper and cinnamon and other oriental spices because their taste buds had been wetted by a different cuisine. We know that uh, they um, found out the delights of using soap when they were in the Middle East, and um, it would appear that that caught on back in Europe. After the Crusades, uh, many Europeans were far more open to the ideas of what was going on to the East, what, what was happening in other parts of the world. They, they simply couldn't be as insular as before. Lots of people were open to, well, what's out there? Let's explore this. Let's see this. Um, new intellectual thoughts. Let's see what these people are writing. Let's learn languages. This is when people start to learn Arabic slowly in the West. As the barrier of language dissolved, ideas born in the great Muslim cities began to filter into Europe, ideas that would forever change Western thought. The great Italian theologian Thomas Aquinas used the writings of the Muslim philosopher Averroes to justify the clear separation of faith and reason, a Muslim ideal that formed the basis of all scientific inquiry and led to the European Renaissance. Averroes himself appears in Raphael's classic Renaissance painting of great Western thinkers. Here, alongside Plato and Aristotle, stands a vivid reminder of the debt the world owes Islam. The scope uh, uh, of Islamic civilization uh, has now reached levels uh, which certainly were not uh, accomplished uh, by any other civilization, non-civilization of the world. It actually unified parts of our globe in ways that had not been witnessed before. But this golden age of Islam was not to last. After shrugging off the Crusades and bringing the precious gift of knowledge to Europe, the great cities of the Islamic Empire would be brought to ruin by a force more terrible than anything the Europeans could muster. Their libraries destroyed, the wealth plundered, the empty cities stood mute in the aftermath of a devastation that descended upon them not from the west, but from the east. It's known as the Mongol catastrophe. The Mongols were Turco-Mongolian nomads from the steppes of Central Asia. In the 13th century, they rampaged across much of Eurasia between the Ukraine and China. It wasn't long before they entered Islamic Persia. To the cultured, urban Muslims, these guys were a bunch of savages. When you entered the Mongol army, you came with yourself and three horses, and you lived off the horses. First you drank their blood, and then when you moved far enough away, you killed them, you slaughtered them, and you ate their meat. And that's why they could go so far and survive so long. Terror was the Mongols' principal tactic. One of the local Iranian leaders foolishly decides to kill off the emissary that the Mongols have sent. And in doing that, he evokes the anger of the Mongols, who want to use him as an example. And they use this retaliatory technique often of killing off entire towns, wiping them out as examples. And so they build these f fantastic towers of skulls where they pile up all the dead bodies as an example. And then, then all the other towns around immediately um, give way. City after city fell before them. It was only a matter of time before they reached the center of Islamic power. On 
February the 10th, 1258, the Mongols took Baghdad. According to the Arab chroniclers, the Mongols put Baghdad to the torch and killed 10,000 inhabitants. Mosques and libraries, the collected knowledge of centuries, were all set ablaze. Within less than 50 years, the Mongols seized the heart of the Islamic Empire from the Arabs. Islamic civilization seemed poised for destruction, lost to posterity. But then something remarkable happened. While the consensus of opinion is that Mongols were a devastating force, I personally feel that they also had a very positive effect on Western Asia and the world of Islam. They opened the world tremendously. And historically, the most significant thing about the Mongols for us would be that they became Muslims, most of them, uh, in the end, uh, converted to Islam, and then became, after being these tremendously destructive forces, some of the greatest patrons of the arts and letters in all of Islamic history. The conversion and its lasting effect was extraordinary. Within a decade, the Mongols had gone from building towers of human heads to building mosques glorifying God. It is not surprising to me that the land conquered the conquerors. The Mongols themselves became Muslims or uh, Islamic leaders par excellence. The Mongols transformed Islam. Now Islamic power could be held by anyone, not just the Arabs who had created it. The Mongols threw open the door for the great gunpowder empire to follow. The empire of the Ottoman Turks. Islam was now set on a new course of expansion to both the East and the West, marching to the beat of Turkish drums.